Good evening, college um, uh, students, faculty, colleagues, esteemed guests. My name is Adela Pineda Franco. I'm the director of the Teresa Lozano Long Institute of Latin American Studies here at UT Austin on behalf of our institute and the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs. I have the great pleasure and honor to welcome you to Development and Debt Challenges in Latin America and the Global South, a conversation between professors Joseph Stiglitz and Martin Guzman. First of all, I would like to express my deep gratitude to Dr. Tichasso, Dean of the LBJ School of Public Affairs, who partnered with us to make this event possible. And to Melissa Guy, director of the Nettie Lee Benson Latin American Collection, for hosting our guest of honors earlier today at the Benson and showing them the jewels that this collection holds. I also want to say thanks to many people, particularly to Paloma Diaz, Beverly Ume, Taisia Kijaski, Amy Kottenheim, Susanna Sharp, and to all of those who played a role in bringing this major event to life. Today's conversation inaugurates the Mary Ann Faulkner Distinguished Series in Latin American Public Affairs and Politics. The new series is named in honor of Mary Ann Faulkner, former first lady of UT Austin during the period 1998-2006. Her husband, President Larry Faulkner, made the growth of Latin American studies and collections at UT Austin a centerpiece of his term. We honor his legacy today with this series, whose aim is to address issues of broad import relevant to Latin America and the world. I can think of no better way to inaugurate the series than a conversation between Martin Guzman, Argentine's former Minister of Economy, and Nobel Laureate in Economics, Joseph Stiglitz, one of the most eminent public intellectuals of our time. In thinking about his role as an educator, Professor Stiglitz once wrote, I quote, I saw my role as a teacher not as pouring well-established ideas into brains that were not yet saturated with knowledge, but as bringing my students along our shared creative process in order to motivate them and excite them about the power of ideas and the potential of a young scholar to make a contribution not just to the academic literature, but to society, end quote. This is exactly the mission of Latin American Studies and Collections at UT Austin. Our aim is to bridge the gap between academia and society and to illuminate the significant role of Latin America and the Global South to develop new creative pathways in science, the arts, politics, and economics. Professors Stiglitz and Guzman have not only provided new perspectives on the theory of sovereign debt restructuring, but have engaged in public debate surrounding the adoption of principles that would lead to a more equitable and just world. I now leave the floor to Dean DiChasso, who will properly introduce our guests of honor. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, kind uh, introduction, Adela. And it, it is uh, the LBJ School's pleasure to partner tonight with Lilas and, uh, and make this event possible. Welcome to you all. We're, we're very delighted to have you here on the 10th floor of the uh, LBJ Presidential Library. And I'm so excited to be up here with our, our, our two guest speakers. Um, let me just share a little bit more about each one of them before we dive into the, the format for tonight, which will be some moderated questions from me, and then towards the end, we'll open it up for audience Q&A. So, so be thinking about what questions you'd like to ask these two. Uh, so Joseph Stiglitz is uh, one of the most celebrated and, and uh, and re highly regarded economist of the last 100 years. For those of you who don't know economics, he received the, the Bate Clark's Medal, 
which is given to an economist under the age of 40 who's making the most important and promising contributions to the field. And of course, he went on to win um, the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences uh, for many things, but his work on asymmetric information and how it impacts our traditional assumptions about market efficiency um, and many, many other contributions to economic thought. But then he saw the need to take all of that economic analysis and intellectual firepower and apply it to policy and to the real world. And uh, we're very grateful that, that he chose to do that. In, in that capacity, he served as a senior vice president for the World Bank. Um, and the, the, the chair of the Council of Economic um, Advisors. He's, he served two presidents, President Obama and President Clinton, and I suspect probably others that I don't know about. Um, but one of the things that really um, distinguished Professor Stiglitz is, is his, his willingness to speak his mind and to be honest, uh, even if it meant disagreement and occasionally policy conflict. The intellectual honesty it, that, that motivates him is really admirable in, in these, kind, these high level policy contexts. Um, and so thank you, Professor Stiglitz, for joining us. Um, and then Professor Martin Guzman started off, uh, he, he looks young, he is young, but he's already been the Minister of Economy for the Republic of Argentina. Uh, he received his PhD from Brown in economics and uh, is, is currently a um, professor um, in the Department of International and Public Affairs at Columbia. Um, he's also a professor of money, credit, and banking at the National University of La Plata in Argentina. Uh, really an expert on sovereign debt and um, economic growth in Latin America. Both of these gentlemen, both of these scholars, have contributed to an effort that, that Professor Stiglitz started called the Policy Dialogue, or the Initiative for Policy Dialogue, uh, which is an academic center at the Columbia Business School that, as I understand it, is, is an effort to broaden the conversation to leading economic policymakers in the global south uh, to be in conversation with the leading economic policymakers in the North to try and, and provide some checks and balances to the multilateral uh, lending organizations and the IMF and other organizations to provide more feedback and intellectual uh, dialogue there uh, that, that, that's also very policy focused. So um, let me just see if there's anything I want to mention. All right, let's, let's just move on then to our questions for, for today. So, you know, we have an audience that probably has a lot of different levels of experience with Latin America, with, with economic growth and with debt. Um, Martin, maybe we could start with you and, 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 and then and turn to Professor Stiglitz. Could you describe um, what are the most challenging uh, issues that are faced by Latin American countries now in terms of managing their debt and, 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 and facilitating economic growth more broadly. And could you put that in historic context for us in the, maybe the last 20 to 30 years? Okay, excellent. So first, I thank you very much for the invitation. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. We had a fantastic day uh, and such a beautiful room. Uh, so uh, congratulations for all you are doing. Uh, so let me put the situation in context. Uh, uh, what's going on in Latin America now, um, we'll focus mostly on, on South America, uh, but there are certain issues that uh, are common to, to Latin America and the Caribbean countries. Uh, the, the main challenge for the, uh, the main economic challenge for the region today uh, is uh, growth, how to grow. The region has been in, uh, it has gone through a, through a decade of stagnation. Uh, the previous decade, the, from the early 2000s, was a decade of economic growth for the region. We saw significant improvements in basically all social indicators. Poverty went down, inequality went down, uh, there were more jobs and even, even better jobs. But uh, that stopped a decade ago. The growth of the 2000s coincided with the super commodity boom. It was a good time for the uh, prices of what the region was selling to the rest of the world. 
And that boom uh, in the prices of commodities was over by 2012, 2013. So the, when you look at the picture today, you see a generation, say anyone who is today between 20, 30, 35 years old, that grew up in a continent in which there were no many opportunities. And that leads to a problem of lack of hope and therefore discontent and political fragmentation. So I hope we can discuss uh, uh, today uh, what could enable economic growth in the region. But I would say to begin with that that's the main challenge, how to restore economic growth in the region. Mm -hmm. Professor Sticklitz. Uh, yeah, well, let me just uh, follow on with uh, a couple comments. Uh, you, you mentioned debt. Uh, you might say Latin America is, with the exception of Argentina and Ecuador, uh, lucky that it's not the center of the debt crisis. There is a global debt crisis, mostly in Africa, very poor countries. And uh, uh, it, it's not likely to have global consequences, but uh, it will have enormous consequences for people in those countries who are already very poor. And uh, the, there are some countries that will be pushed over the brink into real crisis. Uh, there are other countries that won't be pushed into crisis, but they'll, their fiscal space will be reduced. They won't be able to spend as much on health, education, or on investments for economic growth. So it will feed into uh, the opposite of what what uh, uh, Martin has talked about, it will actually impede uh, their economic uh, growth. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is a, just about 25 years since there was uh, what was called the Jubilee Movement, uh, and there was a major debt forgiveness uh, at around the year 2000. And uh, a lot of people were worried that we hadn't solved the problem. We had just forgiven the debt, but we hadn't un solved the underlying problems that gave rise to excessive debt. Mm -hmm. And they were absolutely right. And we are now 25 years uh, later, again facing a major debt problem. And so one of the big issues in a global uh, context is, uh, we have the short run problem of what do we do about the countries with so much debt, but we have the longer run problem. How do we prevent this happening again in another 25 years, even if we solve the problem, mm -hmm. uh, solve the problem today? Okay, and, and so let's build off of that uh, comment. And can, can you all describe to us how the relationship between external creditors and Latin America has changed over the last 20 to 30 to 40 years. Can you mention the Jubilee um, you know, movement? The, 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 internationally, the global debt structure uh, has changed dramatically uh, in the last uh, 50 years. Uh, and uh, that's made the solution to the debt problem today much worse than it was 25 years ago. So things are actually uh, uh, as difficult as things were 25 years ago. And, and the, the, uh, when, we had, when there was the Latin American debt crisis uh, in the beginning of the 80s, which led to a lost decade, illustrating the, the link between debt and growth, uh, there was a lost decade. Um, you could get all the creditor, the major creditors in the room. They were major American banks, a few European banks. And the US Treasury could uh, uh, bring out the whip, uh, twist arms, and get the banks to behave well. You know, carrots and sticks. And, and it, it was not perfect. It, it was actually hard, but it, it happened. Mm -hmm. um, today, uh, there are many more creditors. Uh, we've gone from bank lending to secured as, as, uh, securitized lending. Every hedge fund and has a little piece of the, of the action. Um, 
China is now a major lender. And uh, before the, the uh, governments, uh, United States, uh, the various multi and the multilaterals could work together to uh, address the debt problems. Today, and there was a group, uh, it was called the Paris Club, it still exists, that, that coordinates the, the various countries who've lent money. China's not a member of the Paris Club, and their interests aren't always exactly coincident with, with ours, and uh, their perspective uh, is often different. So you have just many more creditors with divergent interests, and uh, that makes it much more difficult to re resolve these debt, to restructure the debt. You know, uh, one of the things I, uh, I say uh, often, you can't uh, uh, get uh, water out of a stone. And, you know, that, that basically, if countries don't have any money, it's very hard to squeeze money out of them. And uh, you, traditionally, what you do is you cause austerity, you, you make the people suffer uh, enormously, and in the end, the economy doesn't grow, it actually has degrowth, uh, it goes into, and then you have even less money. So the creditors suffer and the debtors suffer. Um, and that hasn't worked, but it's part of, part of the reason for that is this fight among the different creditors each one wants to get his little slice of the pie, of what little there is, and in the fight over who gets that slice, the whole, the whole thing shrinks. Mm -hmm. And so the problem today is much worse. Um, from, uh, there's been, a, in the international community, a recognition of the problem and uh, we, both Martin and I, were involved in, in uh, a, a big effort at the UN uh, to, to uh, uh, put forward the idea that there should be a framework for resolving debt, just like there's a bankruptcy law inside the United States. If you get over in debt, you, you, you have a way of restructuring the debt of debt forgiveness. Uh, we should, international debt is even more complicated, so you need, a, even more important to have a framework like that. Mm -hmm. um, in 2014, the UN overwhelmingly uh, supported that idea. In 2015, they enunciated a set of principles. Uh, it was almost unanimous, only six countries voted against, uh, but they happened to be the important countries, <laughs> including the United States and the UK. So uh, there is no framework for addressing the debt problem. It, it's sort of uh, a, a uh, law of the jungle. The big guys try to beat up on the little guys. And um, maybe Martin could talk a little bit about his experience because uh, Martin, man, he won't say this because he's too modest, but uh, Martin, uh, had to address the largest, one of the largest debt restructurings ever. Uh, the previous government had gotten very deeply in debt, had begun with very little debt because there had been a debt restructuring earlier in, in the century, began with very little debt, and in three years, the government of Macri managed to get the debt up to over a hundred billion, or uh, what well, you can tell that the the numbers, including forty four billion with uh, the IMF, and uh, so maybe Martin can describe uh, the experience of of trying to renegotiate that. And, and Martin, for those that aren't familiar, could you explain the narrative? What what are the stories that countries tell when they take on more debt? Okay, so first. Um, if we want to understand the economic dynamic of Latin America over the last 40 years, which is by the time uh, in which uh, many of our economies, uh, countries went back to democracy, right? We need to look at debt as well. Debt matter. 
uh, in first the 80s, it, it was, and, and to understand the dynamics in Latin America, we need to understand what happens in the North. Uh, in the 80s, we had the uh, inflation crisis in the US and the Fed increased the rates very significantly and our countries were, ha had debts in float with floating uh, interest rates, which meant that when the Fed increased the rates, the cost of that service also increased and increased very significantly. So if you have to spend more of your public resources on debt, that means that you have less for education, health, public infrastructure. So basically, the, what you see is more tensions, people suffer. And in the 80s, we had a lost decade in the continent. The continent, the, the, the economies fell. Some countries ended up having hyperinflations. That's what happens when you have too much distributional conflict. Everything falls on the state. The state cannot resolve its deficits. It resorts to central bank financing at the same time that it continues paying debts in foreign currency. So that was a bad initial condition for many of the democracies in the region. And the 80s was a very bad decade. Then in the 90s, we didn't have the debt problem because there was a large restructuring of the debts, the one that Joe described in the late 80s, early 90s. But most of the countries in the region uh, fell into what was called the Washington Consensus policies that presumably were going to lead to the, you know, Washington Consensus policies, uh, all the reforms in the economy that included liberalization of the trade relations, of the financial relations. Money could enter the country, uh, the countries and leave the country in, just like in one microsecond. And those reforms were supposed to deliver increases in productivity, but it didn't happen. So the 90s ended up also badly for the economic performance in the region. And in, in the 2000s, we had the commodity boom. And actually, there was a movement to center-left governments. And there was economic growth, but what we didn't see was a transformation of the structures of production of, of our economies. They were not really industrial policies, which today are fashionable in the advanced world. They are fashionable here in the US, in Europe. That didn't happen in the 2000s in the region. So when the commodity boom was over, we started a decade of stagnation. And more recently, we had COVID, and we had the war in Ukraine. So COVID put more pressure on the public finances, right? Because we had lockdowns that led to declines in economic activity, declines in tax revenues. And at the same time, governments needed to spend more. So that meant stressing the budgets. Those who could resort to that did it. And now we have a different global environment again. The North responded to the war in Ukraine, increasing the interest rates. The difference with respect to, well, there are two main differences with respect to the 80s. One is the creditor base. In the 80s, it was mostly American banks. So the US used foreign policy very aggressively to avoid defaults on the debt payments of Latin American countries, because otherwise it would have been a banking crisis in the US, very costly politically. I mean, the State Department play a very active role in the region uh, to uh, avoid a, a default, even if that led to hyperinflation in the countries, right? Today, we have a different creditor base. It's not American banks, are mostly investment funds, hedge funds. Uh, but the other main difference is that the bonds of the countries don't have floating interest rates. But Still, that means that when they have to refinance those bonds because the payments come due, they have to do that at higher interest rates. And you get into the dynamic that Joe described. Again, if you pay more on your debt, you have less resources for other things. And what does a politician want to always offer? Hope, a bright future. But when we are in, when we are in the policymaking sphere, what we face is tighter constraints. So we can deliver less. And that's a problem. And I think I went a bit far, but your question was on the issue of... Uh... No, I, I think you addressed it. I mean, I, I, you know, I think one, one question that might help us all is if, if, you know, we have two preeminent economists up here. 
if you were speaking to domestic um, economic policymakers in these countries, uh, what would you what would you be advising them to do to to facilitate growth? Right. What 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 as they're taking on this debt or choosing not to, what should they be doing to try and grow at this point? Okay. So first, there is there has to be a recognition that we have tighter budget constraints. There are less resources. And we have to be wise in how we use those resources. Uh, if one, I mean, if you ask me, I would spend for less on subsidies to consumption of energy and more on what creates knowledge in the economy. And also on what, on the infrastructure, the critical, both digital and physical infrastructure that increases the productivity mm -hmm. of the economy as a whole, and also that's good for the private sector. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would include as part of this package industrial policy. So on the fiscal management, be wise, define priorities well, because the limits are tighter than 15 years ago. But then Joe can probably uh, uh, guide us yes. on what kind of industrial policies uh, will be beneficial for the region. So, I mean, to pick up on, on what we talked <clears throat> about before, during the uh, commodity price boom, they didn't use that money to diversify their economy. You know, one way of thinking about it is they, they were taking resources out of the ground and their asset base was getting weaker. They were selling their assets. But if they had converted those assets below the ground into assets above the ground, education and infrastructure, they would have become wealthier. But they didn't do that. In fact, what happened in some of these countries is they took that as a moment because the banks were willing to lend more to them uh, because the prices were high to get more in debt. Uh, it's called, in the liter economics literature, uh, the resource curse, that countries with more resources often wind up poorer and, uh, because uh, they, they, they have the false feeling that they're wealthy and uh, they don't, they rely on those resources. They don't diversify their economy. They face this volatility of com commodity prices. They uh, wind up also in a political problem of when resources prices are high, getting political conflict of who gets the ranks from the resources. So countries without resources sometimes are better off because they don't have that. They, the only way they can grow is they know uh, investing in their people, uh, 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 diversifying uh, their economy, thinking about what, what they can do. You know, you think about Switzerland, it doesn't have a lot of resources, uh, but uh, they, they've been very innovative in, in, in certain areas. So, so it's, it's, uh, it's sort of the negative of the resource curse. Um, so uh, to me, that's one of the important ingredients. Now, part of Latin America's problem is they have been, as uh, 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 Martin said, the victim of uh, neoliberalism or the Washington consensus. For those of you who don't know, the Washington consensus was a consensus between 15th Street in Washington uh, on Pennsylvania Avenue, which is where the U.S. Treasury was, and 19th Street, where the IMF is located, and the World Bank is in the middle at 18th Street. So it was a consensus among three people, uh, three institutions, about what the right development strategy was. And it turned out not to be such a, a good strategy. But one element... What was wrong with it? What I would say, one... Two elements, uh, there were many things wrong with them. <laughs> I, and I, that would be, uh, it would take me all day. And, <laughs> uh, but uh, one thing is, they didn't pay any attention to inequality. They, that, they thought that was not a very interesting subject. Um, 
the second thing was uh, that they didn't believe in managing capital flows. Just open up your market and money could flow in and out and they weren't thinking about how destabilizing that could be. And they weren't thinking when money was coming in, what was it being used for? Was it being used for productive investment or was it being used for a housing bubble or a real estate bubble or something like that? So that was a, a, another element that, that uh, but for what we're talking about right now, one of the big mistakes was it said industrial policy was a bad thing. Industrial policy just means government intervention in the market, what, what is produced and how it's produced. And uh, right now, uh, around the world, uh, there is, you know, to be frank, a lot of uh, anger, I don't know if that's the right word, towards the United States over this issue. Because for 40 years, we told countries not to have industrial policies. Not, you know, it was a, a no-no. Uh, you know, uh, the IMF would, would threaten to, to cut you off from assisting. And then all of a sudden, uh, the U.S. has adopted industrial policy uh, with the CHIPS Act for um, uh, providing chips and science research, the IRA for climate change. I think we did the right thing. We didn't do it in a, in a optimal way, but you never, politics is never gives you the chance to do it. But it was important for us to start addressing climate change, and it was really important for us to develop a, a, a resilience to our economy, to have an independence uh, from uh, the dependence on, on uh, Taiwanese uh, chips. So it was really, it was very clear that, that the way the market on its own had led us was make us very vulnerable and unresilient. So it was the right thing for the U.S. government to begin. But the point is, we had told countries for 40 years not to do this, and that meant they didn't have, feel that they had the policy space to take the active measures necessary to help diversify their economy so that they would not be so dependent on natural resources and so they could weather these vagaries uh, of the prices of, of commodities. Do you have anything you wanted to add to that, Marty? No. Okay. Um, so you've described the, the, the current setting as one in which a lot of private lenders are issuing debt in Latin America uh, and the U.S from a bilateral perspective, is pretty much absent from that. If they operate at all, they operate through the IMF and the World Bank and organizations like that. But that's not true of China. And since the Belt and Road Initiative and, and when she came to power in, what, 2011, sort of, you know, becoming president, um, China has made significant investments in Latin America can you help us understand the nature of those investments? How much of that has been direct foreign investment in infrastructure? How much of that has been loans? And what effect has had that had on the continent? Okay. So uh, China has been the, new, the novelty in the, in the current century for the region. Uh, that, and I would say China is the main difference in the geopolitical uh, environment uh, over the last 20 years with respect to the 80s and 90s. Uh, first, because of the uh, commodity boom that came mainly uh, as a consequence of the growth in, in China. But then China has been playing a more active role in the region, uh, mainly through lending. And the kind of lending that China provides uh, is of course attractive uh, when you don't have alternatives but if you look at it in absolute terms, it's not the kind of lending that is used for uh, productive development in the region. China, what China wants is uh, cheaper commodities. So the typical infrastructure projects that are financed are those that decrease transportation costs, including ports. And 
when you look at the trade data of Latin America with, with China, what you see is a pattern in which, except for Mexico, Mexico is the exception, but the rest of the continent uh, exports commodities with low value added to China and imports high tech or medium tech manufacturers from China, which is a bit like replicating uh, all colonial patterns. So that kind of relationship doesn't play well for the economic development of the region. But again, falling into the Washington consensus didn't play well for the development of the region either. So ultimately what this tells us is that the region needs to find its, the, its own way. And the, the integration, the integration is key. And as part of that, the, with the inte integration, I mean, for instance, uh, inf transnational infrastructure projects. What's the reason why electricity can't go from the most southern point, point of Argentina to the north of Brazil? It's not a, there isn't a physical reason for that. It's lack of infrastructure, not the natural reason. There is a, the problem is the lack of, of infrastructure. So the same with gas. Um, the investments, transnational investments in infrastructure could increase economies of scale, as we economists speak. It could lead to increases in productivity, but of course China is not going to provide that kind of financing because it's not in the best interest of China. And the IMF or the, the institutions, the, the, the classical uh, multilateral institutions don't provide that kind of financing either. So if you ask me, I, and that's something that I've been pushing for, I think the region needs more relevant, more important regional development banks, like for instance, the CAF, which is the Latin American uh, Development Bank. And one last point, uh, the advantage that today China has over the US when it comes to the financing relations with, with Latin America is that China kept, the state kept the possibility of providing direct financing. And the US doesn't have that. The US does it through the multilateral institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, or it's the, the US private sector that provides financing. But that financing is more, more unstable. Expectations can change from one moment to another, and there is nothing that you can do politically to resolve that. It's not a foreign policy action what leads you to resolve the problem if you get cut from the international financial markets. So that, that's part of what makes, that has changed foreign policy in the region. Relations with China became easier uh, uh, visa, uh, than uh, relations with the US in comparative terms. And financing has a lot to do with that. Did you want to add anything yeah, uh, China? Just a couple. Uh, when we look at this from a global perspective, moving outside of Latin America, these problems are much worse in Africa. Uh, that uh, China's uh, uh, lending to Africa has been very. Uh, has been has been very significant, and um, we've been almost absent in providing uh, funds for anything other than health and education, uh, but not for infrastructure. And what is very visible is, is obviously infrastructure. And uh, you know, there's a there, there's a, a joke uh, about uh, when uh, Americans uh, officials come uh, to uh, Africa, they deliver a lecture, and when China comes, they deliver money. Uh, so uh, the the, the uh, we have strong views about what countries should do for their development, but we we don't. Have, have the assistance, and partly we rely on the World Bank and the African Development Bank to deliver the money for infrastructure. And uh, that's not, that doesn't have the flexibility uh, that, that China has. Now, you know, there are a lot of downsides of China's lending, partly what Martin mentioned, it's maintained very much the colonial pattern. It really is, hasn't been focused like we were when we were in the World Bank, saying when we gave money, we thought a lot about 
how it would promote development. Uh, China actually sends uh, 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 hundreds of thousands of workers to build the, those roads. So it doesn't even create jobs uh, in those countries. It doesn't try to develop businesses that would sustain development beyond that. So it doesn't have this development mentality. And secondly, um, they're uh, more willing to um, uh, be corrupt, to put it, I guess, uh, uh, bluntly. Uh, they're, they're more willing to give political loans where there's no economic payoff uh, and for which there's a political uh, payoff. But that has a consequence, which we've seen in uh, like a place like Sri Lanka, where the country can't repay the loan. And so now uh, China, 10 years after the beginning of, of the Belt and Road Initiative, it began in 2013, um, uh, they're realizing that they're not going to get the money back. And the net flows to the developing countries uh, from China have now become negative. Um, but that's also true, by the way. The private sector uh, has also been involved in a lot of corruption, like in, Madaga like in, in Mozambique, and a lack of transparency. And the private sector net flows to uh, the developing world are massively negative right now. And that's a phenomena that's sometimes called the sudden stop. You change sentiment, money that was flowing in uh, stops flowing in. And that's why you need government, uh, multilateral institutions to be stronger than they currently are. So we're going to open it up to audience questions in just a moment. Um, so my last um, preset question to you is, what can and should the US do to be more supportive of growth and welfare in Latin America? OK. Uh, when it comes to my country, Argentina first, uh, I would say not to provide more financing uh, through the IMF <laughs> for political purposes in Argentina. Because I would say, Joe, that the, the biggest political loan uh, in history was not provided by China. It was provided by the IMF during uh, President Trump's administration in 2018. $45 billion were disbursed out of a $57 billion loan. That's the, the, the most absurd loan that we've seen. And it was to support the political campaign. Of, by the way, that's a lot of money, even in Texas. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, uh, but um, the, okay, so what can the U.S. do? Uh, something that I've been pushing uh, specifically in my country, but also uh, we had some conversations in Brazil about it, is that the, the region, and particularly the Mercosur, which is Argentina, Brazil, uh, um, Paraguay, and Uruguay, uh, but it can be enhanced. Uh, would benefit from a well-designed uh, trade and investment agreement uh, with the U.S. Uh, well-designed in the sense that allows, that creates a win-win. So there has to be a win for both sides. And for the region, uh, what's key is that in the energy, in the process of the energy transition, uh, when we develop the lithium, you know, Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile have lithium, uh, there is value added in the development of this resource. And also, uh, in a geopolitical context uh, featured by instability, uh, it would be good for South America to be part of the uh, value chain of semiconductors. If there is a disruption to the global value chain of semiconductors and our countries don't have access to semiconductors, we will have a macroeconomic and employment crisis. Right? So we wouldn't be producing cars, for instance, that demand jobs, uh, and the U.S. is implementing uh, subsidies to the, 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 two bill, the two laws that Joe described, the uh, Chips and Science Act and the Inflation Reduction Act. So if there was a kind of agreement in which the region that lacks financing was eligible for those subsidies, at the same time that the U.S. benefits from certain kind of agreement, 
that would be good for the region, and it would break with this pattern of uh, not necessarily deals, but integration in which the region ends up exporting commodities, falling in the uh, resource course, as Joe uh, uh, calls it, and uh, importing a, a high uh, value added uh, goods. So to me, that would be the where to focus the efforts. And let, let me add, add just a couple of things. One, one of them is, I think we, we should be playing to our strength, and one of the strengths of the United States is our educational system, especially our higher educational system. You know, it really is uh, the best higher educational system uh, in the world. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that also includes research systems. So we ought to be opening up uh, major joint research projects, uh, uh, having more exchange students uh, with, with Latin America, joint programs with Latin America, to sort of integrate better the two research and education establishments. Uh, and I, I think that would uh, help move the diversification of Latin America uh, move it, you know, higher value added, so it's not confined to producing just commodities. Um, related to that is uh, rethinking uh, more broadly trade agreements. Uh, the way we we used to think about trade agreements, global agreements covering all kinds of areas, and negotiated for. <laughs> decades or years, um, they're not going to get through, and uh, U.S. Congress, they're not going to get through the world. And uh, with Latin America, they, they, they've always had a problem because U.S. agricultural protectionism meant that uh, we couldn't really have a free trade agreement. Uh, you know, we, we say, uh, we have to protect our agriculture, so it's not a free trade agreement. Mm -hmm. So we never had a free, we, uh, the idea of a free trade agreement with, um, with Latin America never was on the table, even though we talked about it. But we could have more narrowly defined trade agreements, focusing on uh, common areas of interest like climate. Uh, you know, so for instance, it's in all of our interests that the Amazon be preserved. And thinking about how we could have an agreement that of green products and that uh, whatever Brazil produces in a sustainable way in the Amazon would get free importation, you know, tariff-free uh, importation into the United States would provide incentives for Brazil to, to use the Amazon in a productive way, in a, and, and, and they're very much on board of that kind of, uh, uh, of an agenda if we would be willing uh, to go along with that. So those sort of uh, thinking about areas where uh, there are mutual interests, and I think there are a lot of those areas, and where we're playing to our strengths, where we can work together, I think our, is the way that we would most uh, would help us, but also help Latin America. Fantastic. All right. Let's see if we can get a couple of questions from the audience. Please identify yourself, um, raise your hand, and then state your question. And please uh, do try and, and stick to questions. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Robert Garriott, and uh, it, it, from your discussion, it, it appears that um, you know we're going to be entering a time w which we'll call the debt collection time, trying to get money out of um, Africa and South America. How would you compare, contrast the approach between the United States and China in uh, in recovering <laughs> the debt, and uh, which approach is sort of best for uh, for the regions? Well, part of the problem is that 
to some extent, uh, the two approaches are uh, a little bit different, and that makes and they talk a different language, uh, and that may you know I, I talked about the inner creditor problem. If you don't solve the inner creditor problem, you you can't solve the problem because nobody wants to say I'll accept less, knowing that the money is going to be more money for the other creditor. So they want to give, they may want to give money to the country that's obviously suffering, but they, you know, uh, uh, they don't want to give money to China, and China doesn't want to give money to U.S. private creditors. Uh, one of the interesting things is the U.S. private creditors and China both use some of the same language in defending what they're doing. Uh, the... China says, look, at, it's not our money, it's our people's money. And we can't just give our people's money away to some other country. Uh, we, we made a loan, we signed a contract. They start talking about property rights. And that's exactly what our private sector says. You know, uh, Black, BlackRock says, uh, it's not our money, we're just managers. Uh, we're trustees for those, and, and we can't uh, uh, renegotiate. Uh, so they both use that same language, but in the meanwhile, while they're both doing that, the country is really suffering. And interestingly, I think the creditors are, are suffering. Now, one of the uh, interesting things we didn't get a chance to talk about that's on the table right now is uh, a change in the laws of New York State and the United Kingdom. Most of the private creditor loans are done through New York or UK. And uh, there are peculiar provisions in both of those that uh, incentivize people, particularly in, the, in, in, in New York, not to resolve. They get 9% interest while they're waiting to, for a judgment. It's called prejudgment interest. It's, a, it's the best investment you can make is, is have a country go into bankruptcy and then just string it out. Just wait, 9% yeah. you're guaranteed. Um, so it, it's outrageous and there's a discussion. Uh, there, there just was a statement uh, yesterday from the Undersecretary of Treasury raising, suggesting that the U.S. government is now worried about particularly that issue. Um, uh, Martin, do you want to? No, I just want to um, add one clarification point, which is that when creditors, I mean private creditors or China, uh, lend to countries from the South, they lend at much higher rates than what we call the risk-free rate, the rate on the U.S. Treasury bonds, which basically is a recognition that there is some risk. And there are circumstances in which the risk materializes, and there needs to be restructurings. Otherwise, uh, I mean, the debt can't pay the debt, right? So if the country goes into the stabilizing spiral, that's impossible. And when it comes to comparing creditors, uh, international financial institutions like the World Bank or the CAF they lend at low rates. Actually, they lend at con concessional rates, which means that there is a grant element, like a donation in the, in the loans. So it wouldn't make sense to treat multilateral development banks in the same way as uh, China, Chinese creditors or private creditors, because they are, take, they are lending under different terms. Okay. Let's see if we can get two more questions in. Uh, I have the mic, okay. if you allow me. Dr. Stiglitz, Dr. Guzman, we were talking this morning about the experience of the Chicago Boys in my country in Chile. And the Chicago Boys were a group of trained uh, economists at Chicago who implemented very neoliberal policies in authoritarian context in Chile. At some point, I wonder if that was the dream of all the economists to be able to implement their wildest ideas without the pushback of civil society. But the question is, is there space in economics for an ethical discussion about political context? Why implementing reform and democracy matters? Why don't you, why don't you, uh, 
yeah. Uh, so the, I think uh, the role of politics in economics is completely underrated. Uh, it's key. I, I think of economics also as a, not only, but also as a political science. Uh, the, all the policy decisions happened not in the vacuum, but in a context of power relations. And no one has the truth. This is something in my country we're going through now, right? Like a, a government that would like not to have to engage with Congress and govern by decree. Um, still institutions work well, and, and that's not uh, possible at the moment. Uh, but the, the political work is extremely important, and it should be more value. And any process, any economic policy package that attempts at uh, delivering prosperity uh, in a country should also be a political plan. It should be part of a political project. But I'll leave the part of uh, Chile and Pinochet and Ch Chicago School to, to Joe. Well, <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, so, you know, you should, this, what we sometimes called the Chicago School. Uh, People like Milton Friedman, George Stigler, Ronald Coase, uh, they had a very particular model of how the economy works. And unfortunately, it was wrong. And uh, it, it was wrong in many, many ways. It assumed that markets are perfectly competitive and in, uh, they aren't anywhere and they've gotten less competitive over time. Uh, the particular work that I was uh, uh, involved in was showing that when there is imperfect uh, information, uh, uh, asymmetric information, imperfect risk markets, imperfect capital markets, which is always, markets are never efficient. Or, you know, there's a Adam Smith's famous uh, thing about markets are, uh, the economy is, uh, the pursuit of self-interest leagues as if by an invisible hand to the well-being of society. And uh, I summarize some of my work as showing that the reason the invisible hand is invisible is it's not there. <laughs> and, and it doesn't lead to those outcomes. So, uh, but the most striking thing in, the, in this relationship between econ economics and democracy is that Milton Friedman said that he wrote a book called Capitalism and Freedom, and he argued that free markets are necessary for uh, political freedom. And at the same time, he went down, supported Pinochet, and uh, had no qualms at all about using authoritarianism to impose his view of the economy, which led to a major banking crisis, which it took Chile 25 years to dig itself out of, and uh, you know, really a long period of economic stagnation. Uh, it finally recovered, but economists eventually recover. But it was this um, uh, inconsistency between his argument that he was really concerned about political freedom when, and that's why you need economic freedom and then his own behavior, which is I think very telling about where his own, own uh, values, uh, what he was really uh, concerned with. Um, so I have a, a book coming out um, uh, called The Road to Freedom, uh, Economics and the Good Society. Uh, the title, some of you may uh, recognize, is a riff off of Hayek's famous book called The Road to Serfdom. And uh, one of the main arguments of the book is that um, the neoliberalism, neoliberal economics, has put us on the road to populism, which leads to authoritarianism, and is actually, uh, it's not uh, countries with too much government 
that like Scandinavia that are facing authoritarianism is countries with too little government where there, there is a, a lack of hope and that leads to a, a search for um, authority figures and demagogues. Wow, so I, I feel like we're getting to the good stuff here now. But <laughs> let's go with just one more question. Um, Tori? Yeah, okay. Jorge, a pleasure to be here with you. What will be a third economic institution that you will like to see develop in Latin America other than robust financial uh, systems and free trade agreements? With other institutions? Um, I would like to see, um, at least in my country, no, each country is different, but in my country, a, a reform of the architecture of the state that leads to a more transparent state. I have come to the view that one of the most, um, the, one of the worst problems for the functioning of the society and the economic system as part of the society is corruption. Um, and both corruption American style, which today is becoming more present in, in South America, and corruption Latin American style, okay? <laughs> Uh, it completely distorts the working of the system. It infects the judiciary. Uh, it ends up infecting all this, the, the whole institutional apparatus. And it distorts public policy. Uh, also, it instills fear on people. Those that were part of that feel fear. So then the only objective, so politics is, ends up having as the objective just winning elections for survival rather than uh, putting the system of power uh, for the, to the service of transformation of realities of the people. It completely distorts the public policy. Short-termism is what dominates. You have to win the election. Now, you need to survive today. That's what matters. It's a very important problem. If you, has, if you had asked me this question five years ago or 10 years ago, I wouldn't have provided this answer. But I just found it so important that, that I would take it as a, a top priority in terms of uh, uh, reforms, a state reforms to somehow address that uh, sickness that the region has. Joe, anything you want to add? Yeah. Um, at, the, at the root is the, political system, is the political system because the political system writes the economic rules. And markets don't exist in a vacuum. Uh, you have to structure them. You have rules, regulations. Every, every country has rules and regulations of uh, one form or another. And how those get written make a big deal of difference. And they are written in a political system. So you first have to begin with the political system. Now, in terms of the political system, in some ways, the most important uh, Part of that is uh, the whole electoral process. Uh, so I'm a big supporter of uh, um, uh, compulsory voting, so that you don't have, you know, the issue isn't getting the vote out. It's the issue of informing the citizens of of, your, of, of, of what the arguments are, um, of uh, getting money out of politics, because that is probably the most corrupting uh, aspect of, of that. And, you know, in the U.S., it's Citizens United but is sort of the hallmark of, of, of that. Um, little details like um, the winner-take-all system, is, which the, the, who gets you know the first past the post or uh, those tend to uh, make things worse. Um, you know, every political system has problems uh, uh, in terms of uh, others, proportion representation have problems in getting coalitions. But uh, I think the experience, particularly in Latin America, is that the presidential system uh, and the first past the post has uh, institutional problems that make uh, governance uh, very difficult. Now, in terms of economic institutions, you know, uh, 
you need to develop those institutions. So for instance, we were talking about how do you get good um, industrial policies. Uh, some countries have been successful in creating good development banks as one mechanism of, of doing that. And those are institutions, you, you, you have institutions that have a certain degree of transparency. None of these are perfect, but they work reasonably well. And that's as much as you can really expect. And if you have enough transparency and in terms of institutions within the society, creating a more robust civil society and a robust press so that you have uh, a systems of checks and balances. Um, that's probably the most important. We talk about in the United States, our system of checks and balances within the government, but I think what was really even more important or as important is checks and balances within society and that there are no groups in the society that are so powerful that they can shape the agenda um, and, and, and distort uh, the direction the society goes. Right, well, I think we're gonna have to wrap it up there. Um, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Martin. Thank you.